We tend to be creatures of habit. Our mind has lots of ruts. You slip into the rut and you just go following wherever it usually takes you. It's like driving through the snow. Years back when I was young, still an inexperienced driver, I was driving down a snowy road one day and got stuck in a set of ruts and it plowed right into the back of a parked car. Couldn't get out of the ruts. Fortunately for me, the car was parked illegally. <laughs> it was quite a story. The owner of the car apparently was a large-scale contractor in Alexandria. When the cop came, he pulled out his card, tried to impress the cop with how powerful and influential he was. And the cop saw this poor, nervous 16-year-old felt sorry for me, so I gave the man a ticket, and I got off free. But a lot of times we parked, we plow into parked cars and other things with our ruts, and the cops don't let us off. And also fortunately, however, we tend to have many different habits. That sutta we had on, we chanted just now on not-self. The Buddha never says that we have no self. He doesn't say that we have a self. But he does analyze how we make a self, and we tend to make lots of selves. The notion of self basically comes from our desire for control. And in some cases the control is skillful. If we didn't have any control at all, we'd be totally helpless. We do have a measure of control over our actions. Which is why self-making is a habit. And as with all habits, sometimes it's a skillful self and sometimes it's an unskillful one. The sutta we chanted just now was aimed at people who are ready to become arahants, who are at the point where they could let go of all of that. They'd, they were on the verge of total awakening, at which point the issue of control is no longer an issue. But up to that point, we have to have some sense of control in our practice. The insight of the Dharma eye, seeing that whatever is subject to origin, origination is also subject to passing away, doesn't deal simply with impermanence, but also deals with causality. There's a connection between the fact that something is caused and the fact that it will eventually then pass away when the cause passes away. But it's important that we learn how to take advantage of causality while we can, while we still need to. Which means that we learn how to take advantage of the fact that we have this selfing habit. If we were stuck with just one self, and it was already defiled, there wouldn't be much you could do about it. You'd have to wait for somebody else to come along and clean up your act. In fact, that's the whole proposition of Pure Land Buddhism and a lot of religions throughout the world. Your self is so corrupt that you can't hope to do anything about it. So you've got to wait for Amitabha or somebody else to come down and straighten you out. But that's not what the Buddha taught. If selfing is an activity, you can do lots of different kinds of selfing. And we already do it anyhow. If you look in the course of the day, there's the, there's the you that can cook. There's the you that has to deal with people. There's the you that has to move your body around. There's the you that can think about things. All kinds of different yous in there. And so as we try to train ourselves, it's our different selves are training one another. They can observe one another. So this is an opportunity that we want to make the most of as we practice. In other words, learning how to step back and become an observer and watch the mind's other habits to see where they're skillful, to see where they're not. And if you see that you're heading off in an unskillful direction, you try to do something that 
would steer you in a more skillful direction. If you notice that you tend to focus on negativity, there's a part of your mind that can observe that. And then make the decision to say, no, we're not going to go in that direction, we're going to go in another direction. And a lot of the meditation is providing you this more skillful self with tools so you can steer the mind out of its old ruts. So you don't have to keep plowing into parked cars. The Buddhist teachings on the, the Ten Recollections are useful in this way. The basic meditation technique he taught was breath, which is one of the Ten Recollections. You keep the breath in mind and you learn how to use it as a way of giving the mind a home, a place where it can settle down and feel at ease. And being with the breath, you develop this quality of the observer, just sitting there watching the breath. It's a neutral topic, but you can learn to make it decidedly pleasurable, and really intensely pleasurable. That's possible. But that requires that you learn how to observe yourself, what perceptions you have of the breath, how you picture the breath in your mind. If you think of the breath energy as already permeating the blood vessels, the nerves throughout the body, it changes the way you think about the pumping in and pumping out through the lungs. If you think instead of just connecting all the different power lines of the body, and John Lee uses that image of the power lines going throughout the body, you can connect them up and it doesn't require a lot of heavy breathing to get the whole body energized. Just open up the channels and the breath goes. We're here, of course, not talking about oxygen, we're talking about breath energy. So if you find yourself dealing with laborious breathing, you can ask yourself, well, how do I conceive this process? If it changed my conception, changed my mental image of what the breath is all about, it could make the breathing a lot easier. So try that. Think of the body like a big sponge. Everything is all open, ready for the breath to come in and go out to every pore of the skin. And think of relaxing every pore of your skin. Just hold that perception in mind. And that's one way of changing the way you habitually relate even to the breath. You find that there are a lot of habits related to your breathing. And they probably go way back to when you drew your first breath. You had to figure out what is this process that you're suddenly required to do. You didn't have to do it when you were in the womb. And so you started relating to your breath back at the time when you knew nothing at all. And so maybe you have some unskillful ways of conceiving the process, and they, they can go pretty deep into your nervous system. So question them. Try to replace them with alternatives and see what happens. And if you find that you can get interested in the breath this, in this way, you don't have to worry about the other recollections. The, the breath gets absorbing in and of itself. But there are times when other issues arise. Either you're bringing certain attitudes to the meditation, or there are issues that have arisen in the course of the day. They need to be worked with. In other words, you can't stop thinking, so what you've got to do is learn how to think in alternative ways. If you're feeling discouraged, Recollection of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha is useful. If you're having doubts about the path, think about all the fact that when the Buddha taught, he wasn't asking money from anybody. He wasn't. He didn't really need anything from anybody at all. It was a teaching that was offered in 
total generosity with no agendas. It's hard to find a teaching like that. You think about the kind of person he was. You know, well established, a lot of wealth, power. For him to go off into the forest like that would be like some famous millionaire in the present slipping out the back door of his mansion and just disappearing into the forest for six years. And when he came out, he didn't claim to be a god or anything. He'd, he'd found a technique, developed the skills to put an end to suffering. And you think of all the the honorable people, the men and the women who, over the centuries, have followed this path. And they met with difficulties. They weren't our hunts right from the very beginning. You read the Taragata and the Tarigata. They can be very inspiring. The people can go through a lot of difficulties and yet still come out on the other side. So when you're feeling discouraged about your progress in the path, think about them. Some of them are worse off than, than you are right now, and yet they were able to draw on whatever strengths they had and come out with awakening in the end. You've got strengths too. This is where Ananda once said that this is where conceit is useful on the path. And these people can do it. They're human beings. I'm a human being. I can do it too. If you're feeling like a particularly unworthy human being, you can reflect on your generosity and the, your virtues in the past, the times when you went out of your way to help somebody, or the times when you knew you could take some advantage of somebody and get away with it, and yet you didn't. Reflect on that to re remind yourself that you are a worthy human being. If you're feeling lazy, the Buddha recommends that you think about death. It can happen at any time. Suddenly and without any apparent reason. We received news of two deaths today. One was a, an old monk who'd lived past a hundred, and everybody says, well, that's normal. You get that old and it's perfectly reasonable to die. And then there's a young man, 37, whose aorta burst. That could have been a death, too. And it sounds like it might be worse than a death in the sense that they've got him alive, but he's brain dead. And that doesn't seem reasonable, yet it's all its the way things happen. People die in the womb. People die when they're little kids. They die in the course of being born. Age is not a determinant of whether you're going to die or not, which could be a depressing thought. But then the Buddha says, don't think of it in that way. Ask yourself, are you ready to go? And for most of us, the answer is no. And the next question is, what could you do to get yourself ready to go? Well, practice. You've got the opportunity right now to make the most of it. So if you're feeling lazy tonight after the end of the meditation, well, I'll just take the rest of the night off and remind yourself you may not live to see the sunrise. So put in a little extra time so you have a little bit more mindfulness, a little bit more concentration, a little bit more discernment that you can use. So when the body stops functioning properly. You're not totally at a loss. When lust arises, the Buddha recommends contemplation of the body. This is a contemplation that many of us resist. We say, I already have a negative image of my own body. Why should I contemplate that more? Well, it's not that you personally have the only unattractive body in the world. 
when you start taking the body apart in terms of what's inside there. Everybody's body is un un unattractive. Again, it's useful to have this practice readily at hand for when you need it, i.e. when lust suddenly hits, which can either come when you see somebody attractive or something inside the mind just says, hey, we haven't had any lust for a while. Let's start upon imagining something lustful. And you really got to counteract that tendency. Remind yourself, one, where does lust lead? It leads to a lot of suffering. And to this object that you're lustful about, is it something you really want? The more you think about it in the proper way, it helps to cut through the lust and the desire to have lust. That actually is the, the big problem, is not so much the fact that you're lusting after something, but you want to be lustful. And so much of our society encourages that. That's what keeps the economy going. There's a lot of brainwashing out there to say, well, if you try to counteract your lust, you're going to get sick and twisted. And you've got to learn how to counteract that. You know, the mind without lust is a clear mind. It's an unburdened mind. The mind without lust can know things and see things that a lustful mind can never see. So work on your tools. If you see yourself heading off in a negative direction, try to think in more positive ways. If you're heading off to a particular defilement like greed, anger, delusion, Counteract it with the contemplations that help look help you look at those defilements in a new light. Typically they talk about anger as being cured by goodwill. But sometimes it just doesn't hack it. If you're really furious at somebody, remind yourself that when you're furious you tend to do really stupid things and your enemy is going to like that. You want to please your enemy. It may not sound like a, a noble contemplation, but you've got to deal with your defilement sometimes on their own level. What it comes down to is learning how to observe your thoughts from the outside in terms of cause and effect. And remind yourself there are many yous in there. It's like a big committee. And so learn how to take advantage of that fact that one of you sees another you doing something really unskillful. Remember that the Dharma provides the tools, alternative ways of thinking, and they're just as much you as your other old habits, because that's one of the other good things about this not-self teachings. Remind you, you're not stuck with old habits. You can change your habits. You can choose to be a new you at any time or to strengthen the skillful use which have gotten weak because they've just been overwhelmed by events in your life, by this very unskillful culture we have here. And the Buddha is there to provide you with tools to help that particular you come out winning. So when you find the mind slipping into old habits, remind yourself it doesn't have to keep slipping that way. You're free to change your mind to think in new ways. And your old habits will laugh at you and say, oh, this is weak, It'll, we're going to win out in the end. You don't have to believe them. Well, maybe it will win out in the end, but so what? I'm going to try right now, for this breath, to think in a skillful way. And the next breath comes, you well, I'll try with for this breath too. And you find as you take it one breath at a time, you begin to build up momentum. And since the old you is just a series of habits, if you don't follow the habits, the old you starts going away, gets weaker and weaker. And even if it takes time, you realize, okay, keep chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. 
there will come the point when you chip through. So learn how to keep on encouraging yourself, because this is a large task we've taken for ourselves. And whatever skills you've learned in the past for sticking with a long-term issue or a long-term goal, bring them to bear. So even though ultimately you may not have total control over everything in your life, you find that you can control your intentions with practice, and the area of control will grow. So you can take advantage of these, the fact of these many selves, and instead of being scattered all over the place, you can learn the strategies for allowing the skillful ones to come out on top.